On that day, Jesus went out of the house and sat down by the sea. Such large crowds gathered around him, and he got into a boat and sat down, and the whole crowd stood along the shore. And he spoke to them at length in parables, saying, A sower went out to sow, and as he sowed, some seed fell on the path, and birds came and ate it up. Some fell on rocky ground where it had little soil. It sprang up at once because the soil was not deep, and when the sun rose, it was scorched and withered for lack of roots. Some seed fell among thorns, and the thorns grew up and choked it. But some seed fell on rich soil and produced fruit a hundred, sixty, or thirty-fold. Whoever has ears ought to hear. The disciples approached him and said, Why do you speak to them in parables? He said to them in reply, Because knowledge of the mysteries of the kingdom of heaven has been granted to you, but to them it has been, not been granted. To anyone who has, more will be given, he will grow rich. From anyone who has not, even what he has will be taken away. This is why I speak to them in parables, because they look, but do not see, and hear, but do not listen or understand. Isaiah's prophecy is fulfilled in them, which says, You shall indeed hear, but not understand. You shall indeed look, but never see. Gross is the heart of this people. They will hardly hear with their ears. They have closed their eyes. Lest they see with their eyes and hear with their ears and understand with their hearts and be converted, and I heal them. But blessed are your eyes because they see and your ears because they hear. Um, and I say to you, many prophets and righteous people long to see what you see, but did not see it, and to hear what you hear, but did not hear it. Hear then the parable of the sower. The seed sown on the path is the one who hears the word of the kingdom without understanding it, and the evil one comes and steals it away, what was sown in his heart. The seed sown on rocky ground is the one who hears the word and receives it at once with joy, but he has no root and lasts only for a time. When some tribulation or persecution comes because of the word, he immediately falls away. The seed sown among the thorns is the one who hears the word, but then worldly anxiety and lure of riches chokes the word and it bears no fruit. But the seed sown on rich soil is the one who hears the word and understands it, who indeed bears fruit and yields a hundred, sixty, or thirtyfold. The Gospel of the Lord. Before we take a little bit of a closer look at our parable today, because the parable, as it is the Word of God, speaks to each and every one of us. And in this parable of the soil, all of us are present. It isn't just a crowd of 2,000 years ago, but it's every human being that has ever heard the Word of God throughout the ages, including us. Somewhere along the way, we fit into these four categories. So before I talk about that, I want to talk about our second reading, St. Paul letters to the Romans. And he says something here which should at least in some way or another inspire us or somehow lift up our hearts or make us think a little bit more about our lives and why we are in existence. We're living in a time today, and I'm sure it's not just today, but I'm sure throughout the ages, where the human being thinks, even if he believes in God, that God has created the world, kicked it into the universe, and now he sits back and he watches the world events unfold, whether it's wars, whether it's struggles, crises, difficulties, whatever it might be, God just sits and watches. And therefore, there, I have no control. Things are going to happen and so on and so on. But in reality, it's absolutely false. St. Paul makes very clear today in our second reading. Creation awaits with eager expectation. The revelation of the children of God. For creation is subject to futility. In other words, creation without God is useless. The reason we have a world and we have everything that is in it is for the good of the children of God. It's for the opportunity for all those to do good, to be good, to live good lives, to be holy to live lives of virtue, to use everything in one's life, to grow in love for God and in his image and likeness. Everything else doesn't matter. 
We often like to think that who we're going to marry, when we're going to marry them, our children, college degrees, cars we buy, jobs we have, money we have in the bank, all these things we often like to think are a priority. That's the reason we're in the world, to have these things. But in reality, nothing could be further from the truth. Paul makes very, very clear why everything exists. To reveal the children of God. We probably have heard this many, many times throughout the years. And never really given it much thought. But it should be something which should click in our brains. As a reminder to us that everything that happens in our lives, no matter what it may be, whether it's a job that I'm given, whether it's a car that I buy, whether I marry and have children, no matter what it may be, all of it is there. Because it is given by God. Without God, I search for happiness uselessly. As St. Paul says, everything is subject to futility. It's useless. So all the wars and all the difficulties and all the things and struggles that happen in human history are there to reveal the children of God, those that follow the more law, those that follow Christ, and so on. It's something that we ought to take to heart a little bit more seriously. Instead of looking at the things in our lives as just an existence, as just an experience, as just something that happens, everything in our lives, the saints made very clear, is allowed by God. Even though he does not will sin, he does allow it. Because the idea behind it is to draw the good, even out of a terrible situation. And since we cannot understand the mind of God and why he does what he does and allows the things that he does allow, we are puzzled and frustrated sometimes. Instead of realizing and understanding and recognizing that everything in my life and everything that happens... It's not happen chance. It's there to help me to grow in virtue. The entire mystery of the grace of holiness that grows out of my baptism, that grows out of my reception of the sacraments. I always find it very puzzling that when our children are confirmed, People seem to disappear. The children, the families, they seem to disappear. Over the years, I've seen it in many parishes. But we've done our part. We sent our kids to classes. We paid for the books. We paid our fees. We did this, we did that. So therefore, now that they're confirmed, I don't have to do anything else. As if somehow that was the only reason they were ever baptized. And it's the only reason they were ever called Christians. Somewhere down the road you might see the family come back. Or every once in a while they appear at Christmas time or at Easter. And the children think they've done their part. And the parents push it no further. Which is sad. Because the mystery of confirmation itself is about growth and strength in holiness. But in order to have that grace and that growth in holiness, one must have virtue. Virtue is not talked about anymore these days. Over the years, I have done retreats countless of times to religious communities, to lay people, to whoever asked, on the virtues. How the virtues fit into the human being. And if you don't know what a virtue is, you can look it up in the catechism. It means to do good and be good at all times, 
even when I'm sleeping. There's never a reason or never an excuse why I allow myself to commit a vice. Because I'm virtuous. Talk about, let's say, the virtue of patience. I'm, patience at all, I'm patient at all times. And like I said a couple of weeks ago, if you want to be holy, just go out there and drive on the main road about five times, praying your rosary, and you'll see just how patient you really, you can get holy in one day. <laughs> just drive up and down about five times, and you'll see where you are. If you can do it patiently, you've got the virtue of patience. Thanks be to God. Everything else after that is easy. Kids slamming the door. Spouse coming home and kicking their shoes off in the corner against the wall that we just had freshly painted. It's easy. When you learn how to be patient in the traffic, you got everything else you got made. But the idea is that we're supposed to become virtuous, to reveal us as children of God. Christ is the most virtuous person to have ever lived on the face of the earth. He had every virtue perfectly within him. We are called not to look like Jesus. We are not called to grow a beard and to be a certain size or have the color eyes that Jesus had uh, or, to, or to learn uh, Hebrew or whatever, Aramaic or Latin or whatever. We don't have to do any of that. But the one thing that we need to do to be an image and likeness of Christ is to become virtuous. And I often ask the confirmation students, what virtues did you learn over the years? What virtues have you practiced? And I find it kind of puzzling that our children are no longer taught how to be virtuous. It's not taught at home. It's not given as an example by the adults. And I'm not talking here about everybody. I'm just talking about very general. Because there are good families. There are people who try. And not everything's going to be perfect at all times. But the idea is that our children confirmed the only way that the Holy Spirit can operate in these souls to the gift of confirmation is by virtues. There have to be virtues present in the soul when a person is confirmed. Why is it that so many people disappear after confirmation? They do the exact opposite. Instead of coming closer to God, praying a little bit more, wanting to become a little bit more as a child of God, trying to understand a little bit more what it means to live the moral law and to be Christ-like. That's what's supposed to happen. Instead, of, like I said, I've often seen people just disappear. And somewhere along the way, they just haven't learned the correct understanding. And I always like to think of the virtues sort of as a steering wheel, a steering guide for the Holy Spirit. If I had the virtue of patience, if I had the virtue of gentleness, if I had the virtue of kindness, and whatever virtue, other virtues there may be, confirmation strengthens those virtues. If I have them in my soul, if I've already been practicing them on a natural level, God infuses his grace into those virtues. So the human being may be sanctified. The virtues become sanctifying. And then they grow in heroic expectation as the trials of life beat on them. And as I struggle to live them within myself through all the trials and all the difficulties and things that happen every day. But it's one of those things, like I said today, it's not much thought of. For many people, Christianity is just about service on Sunday. As somebody said to me a couple of weeks back, yeah, we're saints in church, but we're pagans in the parking lot. And you can meet him out on the highway out there as well. 
I was driving on the Autobahn this week, doing about 170 kilometers. Had a nice car. And the Mercedes and the Ferraris and all the other high expensive cars passing me at 220 and faster. It was almost like, it almost sounded like a vacuum cleaner was trying to suck me up. That's how fast they were going. I'm doing 170 and I switch over into a lane and I look all of a sudden and somebody's behind me, I have no idea where they came from. I've driven on the Autobahn many times. And I always look before I change lanes and I look, there was nobody there and all of a sudden there's a Mercedes behind me flicking his lights. I said, uh-oh, better get out the way before he runs me over. So I got over. What did I get? I got the IQ sign. They even use it in Germany. <laughs> it's not just special to us Americans. And I simply just waved and said a prayer that hopefully the guy doesn't drive so fast he gets in an accident, you know. But the idea basically is that we often forget that in the middle of our everyday experiences, we are called to the moral law, we are called to virtue, we are called to be revealed as the children of God, which in today's world is very difficult because today you're labeled. When was the last time you went into a restaurant and you saw somebody make the sign of the cross before they ate? And we Catholics are very identifiable. When we make the sign of the cross, we already know that's a Catholic. But over the years that I've been in restaurants, and you can see I haven't missed a whole lot of many meals, but all the years I've been in restaurants, whether it's by myself or with others, I don't ever remember a single Catholic making the sign of the cross before they ate and saying a prayer to God. I see the other Christian denominations all bowing their heads and holding hands and all that, but not as Catholics. Why? Why are we so ashamed of what should be everything to us, which is God? The people that he created that are in that restaurant, he gave life to as well. Why do I have to be ashamed and embarrassed to make the sign of the cross? I always say my prayers before meals, whether in public or private, it's irrelevant. But many times throughout the years, I've had people come to me and say, thank you, sir. Especially if I didn't have my clerics on. For reminding us to give thanks to God. By making the sign of the cross and bowing my head, I never look around to see if anybody's looking at me. I don't care. I'm speaking to God. I'm giving thanks to God for what he's given me. That is virtue. That is a virtue that we need to practice. And it's a very simple, simple thing. But even that thing has sort of fallen by the wayside. And today we often can be like ostriches. We sort of stick our head in the sand and let the world pass us by. Don't bother me, don't disturb me, don't say anything that's going to bother me, or I'm going to become angry, I'm overreacting, and so on and so on. Just let me leave my head in the ground and pretend like nothing else exists but my own life and me, and that's it. It's easy to do. But to be ashamed of our faith is ridiculous. God made us all. Let us not be afraid to reveal ourselves as children of God. After all, that's why we were baptized. It's the reason why God created the world. It's the reason why everything exists. To reveal the children of God. You could look it up in St. Paul's writings to the Romans as we read it today. Now, let's talk a little bit about this parable today to kind of put it in a little bit more modern terms. I could spend a lot of time on this particular topic, but we don't, we've already spent a little bit of time on that first part there. So, gross is the heart of this people. 
which is a very unusual translation and a very unusual word because in the Aramaic, uh, gross is not exactly the word that's applied. We might think gross, ooh, but that's not what Christ is talking about. What he's saying here is hardness of heart and heaviness of heart. These people are caught up in the world. They're stuck in the muck of their experience. Of only what they can see and sense with their five senses, and that's it. They are weighed down by the heaviness of the material world that they live in. It's been that way for 2,000 years at the time of Christ when he said it, and it still is today. Our hearts are often heavy with the things and the cares of the world. When I go to people's homes to eat dinner and things, and everything runs like a vacuum cleaner. Nothing's about God. Everything's about where I got to go, what I got to do. I got this class, I got soccer practice, I got this, I got to do that, and so on and so on. And in the end, basically, maybe, maybe when it's 6 o'clock, maybe out of five kids, one might be there. And you might wonder, I don't wear a watch, but I just kind of do that sort of by stupidity more than anything else. But when somebody asks me what time it is, it's, well, I don't really know. I don't have a watch. So, but that's the problem. Our hearts are heavy with the cares of the world. And we have to be honest with ourselves. Because in this parable today is each and every one of us. And it's not about judgment. We don't need to judge another human being. It's about the reality of truth. Can I be truthful with myself and say, okay, this is where I fit in. And St. John Christen and the doctor of the church made a very interesting comment about this parable. And I don't know if you've ever noticed it. I would have never thought of it if I didn't read it. But he said that 75% of all Christians that hear the word of God bear no fruit in Christ. 75%. That's a large number of human beings. It's also a very difficult statement to make. But he is a doctor of the church, after all. But he said that in this parable, Christ is implying that the seed that is sown, which is the word of God, into the minds of humanity, which is the soil, bears no fruit. Because it doesn't transform the person, it doesn't make them better. They continue to live in their sins, their vices, their weaknesses, whatever else it might be. Their hedonism, their pleasures, whatever else. And the parable is pretty well self-explanatory. The seed sown on the path is the one who hears the word of the kingdom. Without understanding it, the evil one comes and steals it away. The interesting part about the way that this is put together in the Aramaic is more from the aspect, the evil one comes to steal away, yes, but the evil one comes to twist the word of God. He makes the word of God confusing to people. So they no longer have the actual truth of the word of God. We have over 40,000 different Christian denominations all proclaiming that they have the truth. An average of three new ones being built a week. All proclaiming to have the truth. It can't be right. Because they oftentimes contradict each other. But truth has to be there somewhere. It has to be found. And for that, Christ gave us his church. That truth may be taught. That truth may be found by those who truly seek it. The devil is very good. He makes people think that they have the truth, but in the end, all they have is a twisted word, which no longer has any significance to transform the human being or to make them better. It no longer has grace. 
that was intended to be given to souls. The seed sown on rocky ground is the one who hears the word and receives it at once with joy, but has no root and lasts only for a while. These are the souls that can even have a conversion experience. They can even have an enthusiasm in the beginning. But as time goes on, it wears on them. Maybe somebody calls them a name because they're Catholic. Or because they carry an image of the Blessed Mother in their car, whatever. At one time, they had enthusiasm. But as time went on, it sort of went away. It's like buying a new car. When a new car smell disappears in about six months, eh, it's just a car. Who cares? All that enthusiasm we had when we bought that car is no longer there. And that's the point. Somebody can be enthusiastic and lose that enthusiasm and just kind of disappear. And they lose what God has given them because they have no roots. It doesn't go into their souls to change them. When some tribulation or persecution comes along because of the word, they fall away. Of course, certainly we're not physically in persecution, but sometimes we're made fun of. As Catholics, we're talked about, we're talked against, especially in the Baptist Bible Belt here. And we're afraid of that somehow. I don't understand why. The seed sown among thorns is the one who hears the word. But then worldly anxiety and lure of riches choke the word and it bears no fruit. There's another one. It bears no fruit. We live our lives constantly change, I mean, charging after something else. It's our next meal. It's our next dollar bill. It's our next conversation with somebody on our cell phones. It's our next television program. It's always something next. And St. Augustine put it very succinctly and very beautifully, I think, and very precisely when he said, If your mind is filled with worldly things, you are worldly. If your mind is filled with godly things, you are godly. And only we know what our minds are filled with. If I allow the world to draw me and take me into every philosophy and ideologies and activities and hedonism and so on and so on, I will lose my soul. I will not be fruitful in the word of God. Because the word of God will never sink into my soul. It will never transform me. It will never change me. It will never mean anything to me. Because I have too many anxieties in my mind. So what happens to those 75% of, of Christians that hear the word of God never bears fruit? I leave that for you to think about. I know what St. John Christendom said. But one good thing out of all of this is that we're not on our deathbed. Thanks be to God. We can all change. We can all become better. We can all strive to be this soil. The fourth one. And there is no fifth one. There's nothing in between. You can't tell yourself, well, I don't fit in any of those categories. I'm this uh, or so on. Christ didn't mention, no, I'm sorry. It's one of these four or none. I have to be honest with myself and say, which one of these is me? And like I say, we're not on our deathbed, thanks be to God, so we can still change. And hopefully one day, if we haven't already, will become that rich soil where the word of God is understood, where it is desired and loved, where it bears fruit, whether it's 160 or 30 or even less or more, it doesn't matter. God knows. 
I'd like to think that we're all striving to be that rich soil, to grow in the fruitfulness of holiness, to grow in virtue and sanctity. After all, isn't that what St. Paul reminds us of? Everything else is futile. Creation is about the revelation of the children of God.